Now the Sunday Sermon with Lee Farmer, pastor of Cone Baptist Church, Heathsville, Virginia. Open your Bibles, please, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to begin here in just a few moments in verse 18. So if you'll open here with us. This is a familiar section of Scripture. It's not too complicated. It is a little bit mind-blowing when you think about the subject matter of it. So let me ask you a question to think about and ponder for just a moment. And I'm just going to be honest. Men, I'm primarily talking to you at this point. Have you ever overcomplicated something? Let's be honest. Let's think about that for a minute. In concern for me and my physical situation, my wife decided at Christmas time that she was going to buy me a piece of exercise equipment. She thought it would be something that I need to go along with the other one that I use as a coat hanger. So she purchased this nice piece of equipment and it came shipped to the house in a big crate. And it was so heavy I couldn't pick it up and I had to open it up out in the yard and take it piece by piece upstairs and and to begin assembling this thing in which the direction said a very simple installation, at least an hour and a half. Six hours later, I was almost through. And I'm putting it together. And I get to this one part that absolutely will not fit. Should I read the instructions? Well, maybe, but here's the deal with the instructions. For the first time, the instructions had no words, only pictures, and they weren't very good. So why use those? So there's the one part that I'm working on, and I cannot figure it out, and I'm banging knuckles, and I'm twisting, and I'm forcing, and I'm bending, and it will not go together. And I just threw it down and sat back, and I'm, at this point, I'm imagining all kinds of words. I'm really frustrated. It's not coming together like the direction said it would. It's not coming together in the hour and a half or two hours like it was promised. And I just sat there and looked at this part. And my mind is just spinning. There's got to be a better way. And then I realized the part that I could not make fit actually comes apart. and goes right into where it's supposed to fit and goes back together. And I spent quite a bit of time frustrating and being aggravated over that part. I'm sure it never happens to you, but it happened to me. It was a mind-blowing thing for all of a sudden when I realized how simple it was. And yet, I was just determined that I was going to do it on my own. Do we ever do that in our faith? Do we ever find ourselves determined that we're going to do it on our own? I was making something that was not that complicated, very complicated. Because I wasn't following the instructions that I had been given. So today, as we look into God's Word, I want to see how God unfolds all of this for us to understand that He created something, He put in place something that a lot of people didn't understand because they tried to explain it away. They couldn't accept it by faith. They couldn't accept the power and the miracles of God. They had to have scientific reason for everything. So look with me, please, at Apostles Paul's writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Begins for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So let's stop right there. Think about that particular verse. What do you mean foolishness? Well, here's what you need to keep in mind. The whole concept of of the fact that death on the cross, because death on the cross in their day was considered to be uh, absolute embarrassment. It was dishonorable to die that way. You were the lowest of low. You were a criminal. You were a, a reject of society to die on the cross. And then to take the concept of the cross and then attach to it salvation of God's people, well, people are going, well, that's absolutely nuts. There's no way. You can't take something that's dishonorable and shameful and attach salvation to it. That makes no sense. Absolutely. Therefore, that's why they say it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Verse 19, for it's written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. This is a prophecy coming from the Old Testament from Isaiah chapter 29, where he talks about he's going to use something that's going to absolutely confine the smartest people. Going to conflict them, cause them to struggle. And God is going to delight in these methods as he compounds and confounds the wise. Verse 20 continues, where? Is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So Paul's sort of poking at him right now. He's challenging them. Okay, smarty pants, where are you? How come you can't figure this out? Because it's a God thing. Verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those 
who believe. The world was hearing something that was confusing. But yet in the power of the words of the apostles and those of that day who were believers, people were hearing the message and they were coming to know Jesus Christ and their lives were being changed forever, just as it is even today. And it's a reminder for us that in our own wisdom, we cannot find salvation because it's all about God and His deliverance for us. And as the kids shared, finding that perfect place, perfect presence, perfect people is only done through the power of Jesus Christ. Verse 22 reminds us that the Jews demanded signs and the Greeks, they looked for wisdom. You see, the Jewish leaders were sort of, everything they had to be tactical, they had to touch it, feel it, see it, or they would not believe in it. And this whole concept of what Jesus was about to do was so foreign to them. To believe that He was truly the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah, standing right there in front of them, even though they've been waited for years and years and hundreds of years, they just could not accept it. Could not believe it. And of course, the Greeks, well, they were always wanting to use logic and reasoning and arguments. If you study their culture, you know they would sit around in these places and they would sit and they would consider themselves to be scholars and they would just argue and bicker over philosophies of life and totally miss the core truth. But in verse 23, Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Paul says they can't grasp this. They don't understand the biggest part of the story, the miracle and the presence of God in our lives. They don't understand how God is sending Jesus Christ to us in a simple way to become the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. They lived on this world for a period of 33 years, three years public ministry, and then willingly gave His life for you and for me and for them because He loves us. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. See, we understand that it's not a stumbling block for us. We celebrate it. But for those who were arguing and for those who wouldn't accept the miracle and the power of God, it was a problem. How can you take something so demeaning as death on the cross and attach to it salvation of souls? Well, it's a God thing. Because Jesus Christ took His one and only Son, and allowed Him to die on that cross, raised up before man to become that visual sacrifice so people would see it and understand that He was giving His life for you and for me to pay the price ultimately for our sins. Verse 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now remember, he's not saying here God is foolish and he's not saying God is weak. What he's saying is even God, in his, if there were such a thing, in his lowest moments of knowledge, in his lowest moments of strength, is far beyond anything we will ever be able to comprehend or understand. Keep that in mind. And so now as we begin to understand how he begins to unfold this picture for us, that it's not going to be easy for us to understand. And folks, as a minister, I'm going to tell you, I spent a lot of years in school, a lot more than I want to think about sometimes. I had some quite learned professors, both in college and in seminary, who tried to impart to me great wisdom. But I only had one professor in seminary tell me one time that when he picked up God's Word, he said, Folks, I'm just going to tell you, it's a mystery. There are parts of this that we will understand, and there are parts of this that we will never be able to comprehend until that moment when we're face to face with our Lord. And we get to ask some questions. You know, you've heard Kim share in her testimony that she grew up next to a lady, Miss True, who uh, Kim would go over and visit quite often. And, and Kim said that in her margins of her Bible, she would write down questions that she had for the Lord when the day that she met Him. Things that happened in, to her and during her life that she just didn't understand, but she knew that God was in control. But she was going to ask anyway. And so in, in the margins of her Scripture, she would write down these questions that she had for God, things that she just couldn't understand on this side of glory. But she knew on the other side, she'd get her answers. And so she was excited about that. Verse 26, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. Think about this for a minute. Who did Jesus call as his apostles? It's pretty important in this community. Fishermen, right? And since we have a community built on, on that industry, keep in mind, those were the people he chose. Not just fishermen, but primarily fishermen. 
tent makers, builders and carpenters, one physician among the bunch. That was it. But the rest of them he called people who were not considered to be the most knowledgeable people, but they were the ones that he chose. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Let's talk about that for just a moment. Think back to your Bible stories you learned in Bible school and Sunday school. You explained to me from a human perspective of David and the giant. You think about that for a minute. Here comes this great warrior, a part of a large army of warriors, coming in to take over. And how does he defeat it? By a little boy with a slingshot. Now that's not the way you and I would have written the story, is it? We would have had armed tanks and cannons and machine guns and grenades and everything else to take out the enemy. But that's not what God chose to do. He chose a small boy with a simple slingshot to take out the giant. What about the walls of Jericho? Did they use bulldozers, excavators, cranes? No. What did they use? Trumpets. Now I was in the band... And some people in the band could probably tear down a wall with some of the noise they made with their trumpets. But think about this a minute. He tore down this walls of this vast city, not with a, a, a big, powerful piece of equipment, with people just walking around in circles, blowing trumpets and yelling praise to God. Is that the way you would have done it? Okay, well, let's talk about a picnic. You explain to me how you're going to feed over 5,000 people with a few pieces of bread and fish. God uses His way, which often confounds us and our ways. Because we don't think the way God thinks. Verse 28 goes on to say, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify those things that are. If you just go back and think about the cross... As we said before, that was a symbol of, of badness, of, of evil. That was a, a bad person who did bad things and they're going to die on the cross. And yet Jesus Christ, the only perfect person, died on the cross to carry the weight of our sins. Again, that's not probably the way we would have written the story, is it? God is using something to confound he chose the lowly things. He chose the things that people were despised. He chose... You think about the birth of Christ, and we just celebrated that during Christmas. You think about how incredible that story is. If you and I were going to write the story of how we would bring into the Messiah to save the world, would we have used a manger and a feeding trough? Uh-uh. But He did. Because it reminds us of the humbleness of the story and the importance of us coming before Him in humbleness. God often uses common people, everyday people, to create movements. God often uses humble people to lead the way. And that's what we see throughout Scripture. And we're reminded of it. Verse 30. It is because of Him that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So as the young people shared last week and this week about that perfect presence of God, that perfect place, and that perfect person, we understand that it only happens in a relationship with Jesus Christ because He covers our imperfections. It is, as this scripture says, Jesus Christ who provides for us and opens up that avenue so that we can begin to somewhat understand the wisdom of God, that He becomes our source of righteousness, our source of holiness, and especially our source of redemption and forgiveness. What we have, what we know, it comes from God, not man's reasoning. And verse 31 sums it up by saying, Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Stopping for just a moment to realize that we have been blessed and all the blessings we have are because of Him. Because He's provided for us. We boast in God for He can do all things. We boast in God because we realize that if, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, He has provided a way for us. And in that way, we become a blessing and a source of, of leading others to Jesus Christ. We also understand that we cannot, under any circumstance, save ourselves or guarantee our place in eternity. But we can through Jesus Christ. 
But sometimes, sometimes we just don't understand. Sometimes we're going to have questions. And that's the importance of faith. Believing in things, often there's no physical or seen evidence. But you feel the power of the Holy Spirit. You see the work of the Holy Spirit. God has the answers, even when we don't. And we may not always understand, but church, He does. He does. And what He is desiring from us is to live a life of obedience in following Him. To present ourselves humbly before Him. To walk in the way that He has set before us. So that the light of Christ can shine in and around us to a dark and hurting world. So this week, how are you going to allow Christ to move in your life this week? How are you going to allow Jesus to work in your life so that you can become that inspiration or that point of focus for someone else to want to know more about Jesus, more about our Lord, and more about the hope that is within us? Sometimes it's not the way we would have written the story. It's not the way we'd have told it. It's not the way we would have done it, but it's the way God did it, and it was for a purpose. And I love it because He chose simple people to follow Him and to lead the charge. And I claim that today because I'm a simple person. That's my wife. He chose simple people to do amazing things. And I know if you will just say, Lord, here I am, use me, He will do just that. Would you bow your heads for just a moment, please? I don't know about you, but in my journey of faith over the years, it has truly been a roller coaster. I have had moments when I could just simply reach out and feel like I just touched the face of God. I've had those moments when He has been so close to me and it's been an absolutely amazing experience. And then I've had those moments where I have wallowed in the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't move. But I did. I find myself sometimes feeling like I am just so tight with him right now where it's just we couldn't be any closer. And then there have been moments when I feel like he is so far away. But in those moments when I'm able to repent of my sins, that image of God with his outstretched arms welcome me back into a good fellowship with him is so important. And I don't have all the answers, even though sometimes I will pretend that I do. God has used some amazing situations throughout history to make us scratch our heads and wonder why. Well, it's the power of God, that's why. It's the miracle presence of God moving and shaping and changing lives. And He wants to do that for us today. But you have to know Him first. There has to be that time when you've opened your heart to Him and said, Lord, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Save me from myself. Save me from my sins. And then know, when you ask that of Him, He will do it just like that. Removing your sins as far as the east is from the west. Won't you open your heart to Him today if you've not done so already? Christian, where are you on your journey right now? Do you feel so close to God today or do you feel like I could be closer? Maybe it's just time that you recommit your life to Him and just say, Lord, I want to get excited again about what you're doing in my life. Reignite the fires of me and my in me to help me get excited again about my salvation. Look forward to that opportunity to be that new creation in Christ every day. Maybe just today you need to recommit your life to Him. I don't know what God's doing, but I know in a crowd this size, because there are more than two or three, God is moving. He's doing something in your life. We're going to stand in a few moments and sing that hymn of invitation, and I just pray that, that if God's doing something in your life, you don't have to come to an invitation. We're still practicing a few little COVID rules, but after the service, would you please come and tell me what God's doing in your life? Let's pray. Let's celebrate it. Because I know He's still doing amazing things every day. 
Gracious God, thank you for the opportunity today to be in this place, to worship and praise your name, to be instructed by the reading of your word. Lord, I pray now that as we come to this time of acceptance and invitation, Lord, if someone here today needs to make a decision for you, Lord, I pray that you will move in their lives in a mighty way and that we'll have the power and strength to follow your leadership. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, even sometimes when we are not so faithful as we should be. But you are a forgiving God. Your grace and your mercy is everlasting. We praise that today. Lord, lead us now in this time of invitation. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've just heard the Sunday Sermon with Lee Farmer, pastor of Cone Baptist Church, Heathsville, Virginia, online at conebaptist.com. That's C-O-A-N-Baptist dot com.